Excellent. Good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to our fifth and final day of teacher and student professional development at the 2021 NHD National Contest. And I'm joined by my colleague Ashley DiBraccio and Dr. Christopher Hamner from George Mason University. And we are so excited to be here to talk about the idea of historical argumentation for students. Couple quick housekeeping items. You can see us, hopefully you can hear us. We cannot see and we cannot hear you. We are going to be interacting with you though. So we do wanna make sure that you're ready to go. We'll be interacting in two ways. First through the question and answer box that Mr. Braccio is going to be in charge of. And we're also gonna do some live polling. So don't go far from that computer and be ready to go. Uh, one thing to also note, we are enabling a live transcript on this broadcast. If you prefer not to see the word scroll across the screen, you can simply hit the live caption button and it'll turn it off. If you click it again, it will turn it on. Please note that it is computer generated and it is not perfect, but we know that there's some members of our audience that this is very helpful for. So we appreciate that you're open to using that. So what we're going to do today is really kick off, the whole goal of this week is to kick off the debate and diplomacy in history theme. And we hope you've got your theme book downloaded, you've taken a look at the video, and if you haven't, I don't know what you're waiting for, it's super exciting stuff, at nhd.org theme. But what we really wanted to do today is to really break down the concept of building a historical argument in a couple different pieces. And we like to talk an awful lot about working in a sandbox, right? We've got to just sometimes just pick a topic and pick some historical documents, pick some photographs, and really just kind of play around with them. So we've made the decision today to play in the historical sandbox of taking a look at child labor. This is a topic that most people are pretty familiar with, and there's some really cool resources available through the Library of Congress and the National Archives and the records of the United States Senate and lots of different state historical societies as well. Now, we're just picking this to have something to play with. We also find that sometimes it's easier if we pick one topic to work with. So the first question we're gonna ask is this question of what makes an NHD project unique, right? Because you might pick this topic and there might be another student who picks this topic and there might be hundreds of other students who pick a topic. But a couple things that you need to do in terms of making your project stand out or be different from other projects. So the first thing that's really, really, really important if we're gonna look at this topic is we've got to establish some historical context, right? We have to, if this is the topic we wanna to pursue, we've gotta know a little bit about what was going on. There's one thing that we all know is that history doesn't just magically happen, right? Things come before that create a situation that then has an impact later. So if I wanna study child labor in the United States, I'd have to do some homework, right? I'd have to do a little digging around. So I usually start with secondary sources, right? I might get into some databases that are available through my local library, read a couple articles. I definitely wanna pick up some books because we can't skip the books, right? Books matter, right? So I might read them, whether I read them online or read them on my Kindle or get them from the library. So I'd probably wanna know a little bit about the Industrial Revolution. I'd probably wanna know a little bit about the Great Depression because that's kind of my time period that I'm working with. And, you know, I came across this book when I was doing research by Russell Friedman about the photography of Lewis Hine. And I like pictures, right? So this is something that kind of caught my attention. And once I kind of get my secondary grounding, I'd like to do a little primary source research. I would probably look at the National Child Labor Committee collection, which is the collection of Lewis Hine's photographs at the, li excuse me, at the Library of Congress. I might do a little digging in Chronicling America, right? What's going on in these newspapers? What are people talking about? And if I keep digging in my research, I would identify two key laws, the Keating Owen Child Labor Act that passed in 1916 and the Fair Labor Standards Act that passed in 1938. But in doing my research, I also found two key court cases, a 1918 case that overturned the 1916 law and a 1941 case that upheld the 1938 law. Now, forgive me here, because here's what I did. I just took about four months worth of research and condensed it down to about three minutes. Now, as History Day students, you know this doesn't magically happen, right? But let's just play with this. We're gonna assume that this has happened. I've got this research and I need to figure out what to do with it. 
So this is one of those moments where I'm going to say, hey, if you've got your pen here, I want you to write this down. A key idea and a big takeaway from today's program is this. History without an argument is an encyclopedia. Let me say that one more time. When I was a teacher, this was on my board every day. History without an argument is an encyclopedia. Don't get me wrong. Encyclopedias are important, right? We all use them. But they're not really history, right? They're facts. This person was born. This is what they did. This is where they died. This is where they buried. And that's the start of history, the basic facts. But real history involves an argument. And arguments are things that we can disagree with, right? If I write one, Mr. Braccio or Dr. Hammer might go, you know what, I disagree with that. And I've looked at the evidence and I've come to a different conclusion. And that is the conversation that is history. So what I thought we'd do is take a look at two different possible arguments. So pay attention here. We've got two options that we might want to consider. And again, assuming this is after I've done all my research and come to my conclusions. And I want you to look at these really carefully because I'm going to ask you which you think is the better argument. So no making faces for my panelists. Option A, Lewis Hine took pictures from the National Child Labor Committee documenting child labor and living conditions across the United States in the early 1900s. Eventually, child labor reform was debated and passed in 1916 and 1938, which set minimum wages and maximum hours for children. Option A. Okay, let's take a look at option B. The National Child Labor Committee hired Lewis Hine to photograph child labor. These photographs created an awareness and fueled a debate over child labor and swayed public opinion to oppose the practice, leading to public support for federal labor legislation in 1916 and 1938. Before I hear on the poll, pause for a moment and really think which is the better option, option A or option B. All right, now it's your turn. We want to hear from you. We want everybody who's with us today to take a guess. What do you say? How, vote for option A, vote for option B. All right, we've got about 50% of our votes in. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Oh, this is an interesting one. I get to watch it live. It's really fun. All right, we're going to give it about five more seconds. Last call. All right, it looks like our audience was pretty clear on this one. 93% went for option B, while only 7% went for option A. Dr. Hamner, what would you say and why? I like option B here because according to the standards you just laid out, you're giving us better sense of cause and effect. So option A struck me as accurate facts about Lewis Hine and his photographs. But option B tried to put them into an argument about what kind of effect they had on the passage of legislation. Absolutely. Could, could you disagree with option A? It's hard to disagree with option A because those are facts. We know that Lewis Hine took these pictures. We know that they were documenting labor and living conditions. And it's a matter of historical record that child labor reform was debated and passed in 1916 and 1938. So there's not much there to take the other side of. One way to think of it, option A is the what, right? This is what happened. And we agree on these facts. Option B says why this matters. So let's pause on that because we're going to come back to that because that's really our first post. We've got to get to the point where we have an argument. The second thing we want to take a look at today is how do we get there, right? This doesn't just magically happen. And so what I thought we'd do is take a look at some of our evidence, right? And we've got to start with our sad little child picking shrimp, which, man, that has got to be a tough, tough job, especially without shoes. We've got to take a look at some evidence. So we did a little research here at History Day, because that's what we do best. And we're throwing out some options. So we want to figure out what kinds of evidence can help support our argument. So here's the first one. 
Here's a quote from a secondary source, in this case, the International Photography Hall of Fame and Museum. Okay, so this is a legit place. It talks about Lewis Hines' photography, and it says his life would be threatened if the factory owners discovered his true identity. So he would disguise himself, right? His disguises would take the form of a Bible salesman, postcard salesman, or industrial photographer. Once he gained entry, he would quickly note a child's age, job description, and pertinent information regarding their unique situation. He would then use these photographs for publications in magazines, pamphlets, books, slide lectures, and traveling exhibitions. Eventually, these images helped to convince government officials to create and strictly enforce laws against child labor. Ooh, okay, I like this secondary quote. I'm gonna, I, I read this, I like this. I'm going to put this on hold. I'm going to keep going with some of my research, right? Well, if I go to that collection at the Library of Congress, man, I've got lots of primary source images, and they tend to fall into one of two camps, right? There's one set that are very much about child laborers, just like that secondary source described. They're working in all kinds of factories, all kinds of conditions, and in all kinds of settings, from very large factories down to working in tenement apartments or in their homes. And these children don't necessarily look like they're having the best day, right? They all kind of look like they're having a bit of a rough time. They're dressed in clothes that seem a little stained. They sometimes seem too large for them or too small for them, kind of beat up. But when I dig in that collection, I also see a second set of photographs. Lewis Hine also went to schools. He took lots of pictures of young children in school, and they look a lot like the children on the top left, like pretty happy, pleasant looking kids. He also took photographs in places like 4-H clubs and other things that we would call extracurricular activities. He, he really did a whole collection with the 4-H, which is kind of interesting and probably its own project in itself. But if we look at these children, as compared to these children, I think we have a pretty strong sense. There's a good contrast going on. All right, so I've got my secondary source quote. I got my pictures of child laborers. I've got my pictures of non-child laborers. All right, so let's see what else. I did a little more digging and I went into the National Archives and I found this letter. So this is a letter from a man named Oberlin Smith to an Indiana Senator, a man named John W. Kern, written in July, 1916. And if we take a look at this, it's interesting. It's got letterhead on it from the Ferrashoot Machine Company in Bridgeport, New Jersey. And it's asking for this Senator to vote upon the child labor bill. And this bill is what becomes the Owens-Keating Act. And it's basically supporting it and saying, hey, I think that you should do this. Um, I think that you should, I think that these conditions are a problem and I think we need to do something about that. I think you should vote for this bill. And lots of people write to their senators and their members of the house to advocate for passage or opposition to bills. And the good thing is in history, we keep those records. All right, and then the last thing I found is I found the actual law itself, right? Because if I want to talk about the passage, I've got to find that's a great primary source. So here's the question, though. If I want to show the impact on public opinion, which piece of evidence should I use in my NHD project? So option A is that quote that describes how Hein took the photographs. Option B would be pick one of the photographs of children working. C, one of the photographs of the kids in school or the 4-H club. D is the letter to Congress, or E is the law. So we'd love to hear what you think. If you had to pick one of these, what is the best one that you would pick? So think about it for a moment. Go ahead and vote. What would you pick? Ooh, interesting. All right, about five more seconds. I want everybody to log a vote. We've only heard from about half of you. And we really think it's important. I don't want you to stress about or a right or a wrong answer here, right? Because as we'll tell you, when we do this with teachers, we get all kinds of answers. All right, three more seconds. Last votes, put them in. Oh, we've got votes for all five options. All right. So the way we voted, 3% of you went for A, 14% went for B, 4% for C, 67% for D, and 11% for E. 
Now, before we comment on it, we'd like you to go to the Q&A box and tell us why did you select that option? So tell us, I went option B because, I went with D because. Because it's important for us not to see your answer, but to understand a little bit about your reasoning. Uh, so Dr. Hamner and I can kind of talk through this with you. So let's go to that Q&A box. What did you pick and why did you pick it? And the why is far more important than the what, which is kind of like a good little lesson of history. All right, Mr. Braccio, what kinds of answers do we have? All right, Victor said, I picked D because petitions are usually supported by the public. The letter is a perfect example. Okay, so this is a law, and this is a member of the public for the law. Although, if we think about it, if we really went through Senator Kern's letters, I'll bet you we could find letters supporting and letters opposing, right? Because there's two sides to every debate. And we'll see some more of that later, okay. All right. Um, Alice says B because pictures tell a story. Okay. Well, I would also, I would challenge Alice or any of us who's thinking that, why B and not C? Hmm. So why would you choose the photograph of the child working as opposed to the child not working and go back to that STEM question? If we're looking at the impact on public opinion, so think about why would that influence your choice? What, what other options do we have in the queue? Getting a lot from D. Let's see, Robbie says, I was divided between D and E, but I chose D, the letter, because it would real, reveal the thinking of a constituent. Okay. All right, lots of response for D. Let's see, uh, Donna said B because the image created sympathy. Okay. All right. Obviously, we had a lot of people who picked D. That was our, you know, most common response. Yes. What are some of the reasons, are there any other different reasons that someone went with the letter D, the maybe ones that have been voiced? Most of me, most of them are, are zeroing in on the fact that it highlights a, um, a member or a public officials' comments um, and their response to writing to Congress. Mm -hmm. So that is generally showing that response of public opinion back to their congressional member. Okay. So Dr. Hamner, what kinds of things would you think about here? You know, this was a, a harder one because there were so many options and they're obviously all connected to this question, but you know, your STEM questions asked about showing the impact on public opinion. And so there's no question that the photographs are designed to have an impact. But for me as a historian, that's not proof that they had an impact. So I'm leaning towards D. So you've got the picture and we've got the legislation. And option D, the letter to the member of Congress, is kind of the connecting item. So someone saw the picture and it changed their opinion. And now the letter is the evidence that the pictures had an impact. Hmm, this is interesting. Now, can I ask you a question here? It's very clear, and we, we, I don't think we need to go through this yet, that option A is from a secondary source, right? It's from a, a collection of a Hall of Fame. B, C, D, and E are primary sources. As a historian, what should we do? Like, because that was a good quote. It was really interesting, and it made a connection. How do historians use secondary sources in their research differently than they use primary sources? Sure, that's a wonderful question and I think really important for National History Day. Secondary sources are great to establish facts and to establish context, but there's really no substitute for primary sources. That is things that are generated by the people who are involved in the event to really get at the heart of what's going on. The person who wrote the secondary source, it's a great quote, but they're not personally involved in this series of events. Whereas B, C, D, and E are all things that are generated in the moment, um, things that are directly spring from the debate over what kind of legislation should the country pass to protect children. And I think that's really key because while we use secondary sources and they're super important, we generally don't quote from them a whole lot, right? We use them as our background. We use them to set up our context because if we're pulling quotes, 
we're basically saying, hey, I, I, it's this person's interpretation, as opposed to this is my interpretation as I develop my documentary or I write my paper or I construct my website. Okay, well, this is all really, really helpful, but how do we get these primary sources broken down in order to really understand how we analyze them and then can use them as evidence. So to do this, I'm actually gonna turn things over to Dr. Hamner and he's gonna talk through a little bit about how we do that and he'll share his screen and we're gonna play a little game at the end. So be paying attention. Hang on one second, my screen share just went away. Oh, that's not very nice. I uh, know, it was weird. See if we can try this one more time. No, let's give it back. I am so sorry. That's okay. We have it here as a backup if necessary. No, it was it was going fine. And then okay, you can't see me. We cannot. Do one more try it. If not, we'll just share it from this side. That's why we back it up. It's giving me weird options. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Not a problem. Hey. For some reason, it wants to share the whiteboard. That's okay. You go ahead. I'll, I'll run the slides. Okay. So if you can, I'll just. So I'm glad that we have a chance to talk a little bit about working with primary sources. For historians, this is, you know, almost the entirety of the job is to, once you have those sources that you've tracked down through your research, is to sit down and analyze and interpret them. And this is the fun part and the challenging part, sometimes the frustrating part, but also the exhilarating part. Primary sources are like a big puzzle to fit together, but the puzzle pieces do not magically assemble themselves. So you as a historian have to do the work. We have a little set of tools or historical thinking skills that historians, no matter what they specialize in, use regularly. And what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes or so is just give you a, an example or two of each of these skills. We think of them as sourcing and the three C's, close reading, corroboration, and contextualization. I'm going to talk a little bit about what each one is very briefly, and then we'll have a little audience participation moment and we're going to do a pair of think alouds. So I will pick up a source as if I'm seeing it for the first time, and then I will just talk aloud my internal monologue as I'm trying to figure it out, and your job is to listen to my internal monologue and try to figure out which of these four historical thinking skills you think you're seeing. So we'll run through each four, and then we'll have a chance for you to test your, your mastery in the think aloud. So the first historical thinking skill is sometimes the most straightforward, but it's really essential. We call, we call it sourcing, figuring out what it is you've got and where it came from. And the questions you might ask yourself to get the wheels turning, who made this? When did they make it? And then importantly, who was the audience? So who is the author making this for? Sometimes the sourcing is really easy because it's right on the document. So in this case, if you look in the upper right-ish hand corner, it's dated July 20th, 1916. We know it's to a Senator Kern, and we know who it's signed from. So we've got Oberlin Smith is the author, Senator Kern is the recipient, and we know when this is going into the mail and arriving at his office. And so we can do some fitting it onto a timeline and understand a little bit more about what is happening and what's going on. So in some cases, sourcing is really easy. In other cases, it can be a little more difficult. So if you found this document in the Library of Congress, the image would have some data attached to it. But if you just find it in a loose folder someplace, you might not know exactly um, who or when it was made and who it was made for. But we can still do a little detective work. So this is one of the Lewis Hines photographs, and we know that it's coming out in the 19 teens. The one thing we don't know based on the image is who the audience is, but there's a couple of clues here. I mean, first of all, 
you know, this isn't a, it's a picture of school aged children, but it doesn't look like this is being taken for a yearbook or a family memento. You know, the kids are not facing the camera. They're all kind of bent over. It looks really sooty and just kind of dirty and nasty. So I don't feel like this is a picture that someone is taking, you know, for the families or for a, uh, you know, a family memento. It feels like there's a separate audience involved. And then if you spend a little more time, um, well, let's, let's go next. So that's, that's sourcing and, and that gives you a launching pad to start thinking about some of the other historical thinking skills. The second one is in many ways the most important and it's the skill of close reading. Close reading is all about looking for details, noticing things that are both obvious and some things that are more subtle, and then trying to figure out exactly what those details mean. So let's go back to this picture. What, some of the details helped me figure out that this is not made for like the families of the kids. They're sooty, they're dirty, their backs are to the camera. But there's some other subtle things here. So I, I, my eye went later to this guy at the right who seems like an older boy. And whatever the people on the left are doing, he's not doing it. He's got some sort of like a stick or a club in his hand. He looks like he's sort of supervising them, but he has a kind of pretty stern look on his face. Now I'm thinking like the photographer, Lewis Hine, didn't have to put that boy in the screen, you know, in the viewfinder. We could have done it like this, but it would have been a very different picture. And I have to imagine that Lewis Hines did that on purpose because he wanted to have this sort of, I don't know if he's a guard or a sentry or a you know, manager, but he, he looks kind of menacing and he's standing over these kids with a, a bat in his hand. So now there's a detail there that's giving me some more clues about what the photographer is trying to accomplish here and who his audience might be. You can do the same thing with textual sources. So we've got a letter here and there's a, some language early on about the Keating Owens bill against child labor. And one sentence says, for I cannot seem to believe that anyone would want to see the lives ground out of mere babies. That line goes right. So here's a woman who's saying you have to support the bill. And she says, it's mere babies who are being forced into child labor. So that tells me a little bit more about her state of mind and the kind of argument she's making. Some of those kids are, they seem young and innocent, but I wouldn't say that they're, you know, nine month old newborns, but she's really emphasizing their youth and their innocence by saying mere babies. So that's a detail that strikes me as maybe important. Close reading is about noticing the details even the ones that aren't obvious at first. And so close reading requires you to sit with a primary source for a while and reread passages and look for things that you find surprising or confusing and then try to make sense of them. The third the historical thinking skill we call corroboration. Corroboration is being aware that there are other sources that also are part of this larger historical event and trying to see where they agree and disagree. And this is a really valuable historical thinking skill because it also helps us understand where the argument and debate is happening. So let's take a look at some examples. We've got Lewis Hines photograph and there's a bunch that we've seen that show these poor, you know, it's like something out of a Charles Dickens novel, a shoeless kid picking shrimp or these kids in a sooty warehouse or mine shaft. I mean, it's, Whatever they're doing, it doesn't look like any fun. But there are some other pictures too. So Lewis Hines takes some photographs. Oh, go back. One looks like this one, um, which is a 15 year old who is working as a bicycle messenger, which is a different kind of labor, but doesn't seem nearly as miserable. Um, you know, he's got a nice uniform and he's out in the sunshine, he's got a little exercise, even the expression on his face is different. So we've, we've already got two different data points. The really kind of nasty, 
dirty factory and industrial labor versus some other kinds of labor. And if we dig enough in the archives, uh, we'll find some other letters. I think we can blow this one up a little bit. I just want to show you the whole thing. Here we've got somebody talking about the Keating Owens bill. And we know with hindsight and history, like, of course, they're going to pass child labor laws. Like, that seems obvious. It's a foregone conclusion. Let me focus your attention on just a couple of lines. I desire to enter a protest against the passing of this bill because I think it will be an injury rather than a benefit to the people in the southern states who will be affected by it. Oh boy, what? My father put me to work in a cotton mill when I was 11 years of age because he found that to be the easiest way we could make a living for a large family. And the older I got, the higher regard I have for his judgment in doing so. Whoa! So we've got one set of sources that's saying, oh, the poor mere babies who are being forced to go to work the letter that Lynn showed you had a line where the person said these people shouldn't be in factory, they should be playing by the water in the woods. And here's someone who's saying, my father sent me to work in a cotton mill when I was 11 and it was the right thing to do. Whoa, corroboration is the process of pulling these different opinions, these different ideas together, and then trying to understand the friction. And the debate, which is a word that should be on everybody's lips with next year's National History Day. So corroboration draws your attention to the fact that people are arguing about things in the past. Even something that seems so necessary to us in hindsight, like child labor, there are people who are arguing against it. And corroboration is the way historians try to pull all these things together and say, okay, what is the nature of the conversation? What is the nature of the debate that they're having? The last primary uh, historical thinking skill is contextualization. And that brings us full circle back to some of the things that Lynn mentioned at the top of the hour about being aware of what else is going on at the moment when, when the primary sources you've got come into the world. And a critical thing that I think everybody at the webinar appreciates is how important it is to have context in your NHD project and to be aware of historical events. So we've got, you know, the famous Lewis Hines photographs. But we also know that these things do not spring into being magically because Lewis Hines decided to go on a photo safari one day. He's commissioned to take these photographs. He has to sort of disguise himself to go into these places and snap the photographs. And all of this is happening against the backdrop of a political debate over what the federal government should or should not do to restrict children from working or to put controls on the kinds of conditions they work in. And it's really important to understand the Keating Owens bill and some of the conversations about not just child labor, but about families and the domestic economy and what it means to be a kid. All of those things help make sense of the photographic images because if you don't have that, you start to wonder, who is this guy, Lewis Hines, and why does he like taking pictures of kids in factories? We need to really appreciate what else is going on when he goes out to make these images, and that's the process of contextualization. So those are the four historical thinking skills. When I get primary sources, I'm going through them in, in some order to try to unlock some of the secrets that they have, the things that aren't obvious about the puzzle pieces that are going to help me fit them into the big picture. So I thought what we do now is give you two examples of a historian thinking through sources. I will be playing the role of the historian in this little vignette. And what I'm going to do is put up a primary source and I'm going to just talk through what I would be thinking if I were sitting in my office and staring at a primary source, which is something I spend you know, probably two thirds of my time doing, just staring at primary sources and trying to make sense of them. So we'll do two of them and I'll do one and I'll think aloud. And I'm gonna really try to emphasize one of the skills as I'm thinking aloud. And when I'm done, we'll do a quick poll and you see if you can identify which of the four historical thinking skills you heard me practicing aloud.
Okay, let's do the first one. Okay, so there's a cartoon here and it's entitled The Road to Dividends and then there's two groups of characters. So let me start with the foreground. Um, there's this woman who's, oh wow, she's really skinny and she's dressed in kind of rags and she's like bent over under this enormous sack, which is almost as big as she is, and it looks incredibly heavy, and she's stooped, and oh wow, the expression on her face is kind of, I can't tell if she's worried. She looks like she's really struggling with effort though. I mean, she's, she's literally doubled over, and the bag is just bulging with something. So there's, she's a kind of, um, she looks like an urchin or something from a, from a Charles Dickens novel. Then we've got in the background, okay, who are these guys? Uh, all right, first of all, they are, they're, they're big dudes. They're like middle-aged white guys and they look like they're pretty well off because they've got top hats and the one guy's got a monocle and those are those big warm fur coats that they're wearing and spats on their fancy shoes. And I have to say, most of these guys look like they're pretty well fed compared to her. I mean, she's just, you know, skin and bones and rags hanging off. So there's a real contrast here between the, the, you know, the fat cats, there's a factory in the background, and the road to dividends makes me feel like she's carrying all of their wages, and she's really struggling, and they're kind of out for a nice, comfortable walk. So that's my first pass on that document. Let's open the polling. I was trying to hit one of the four historical thinking skills more prominently than the others. Let's see what you thought you heard. So what do you think Dr. Hammer was doing more? Sourcing, close reading, corroboration, or contextualization? We want everybody to guess. If you guess wrong, that's okay. We work with people all the time. And you know what? Sometimes we all guess wrong too. And with historical thinking skills, they do kind of spill over. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, you'll often, even when I'm just trying to think about one thing, you'll often hear me mention something from something else. It's not about getting the right answer. It's about going through the process of trying to make a good guess. All right, last votes, put them in. All right, our results, 77% said close, close reading, 7% corroboration, but 17% contextualization. That's a big number. This isn't quite as clear cut as it sounds. So what were you trying to do? And why is it that it's hard to separate these skills sometimes? So I was, I was trying to hammer home close reading and looking at details and making sense of them. Um, and so you heard me when I was talking about she's kind of emaciated and they're fat, she's dressed in rags and they're wearing warm fur coats. But the historical thinking skills are sort of a suite of tools and it is a little hard to separate them. And there's certainly some context going on here. The road to dividends and the factory in the back. I, the, both of those are references that are helping to clue us in to the fact that this is about child labor. But the thing I was really going at in my first pass was trying to understand what kind of argument the cartoonist is making. And I think the argument here that the close reading helped me see is how unfair this is, right? The big fat cat industrialists aren't doing any work and they're enjoying all the rewards. And the poor woman who is the person who is making all the wealth for them to enjoy can't feed herself, can't clothe herself and is stooped over. So that was the, that was the process of close reading has already uh, opened one of the locks for me in this source. Why don't we do another one? Let's do it. Okay, so we've got a document here. Can we blow it up one more time? I'm just gonna transcribe it. I want everybody to see the image, but okay. All right, this is, so this is probably one of those letters that's saying, uh, you please pass the bill so the poor kids don't have to work. Uh, we the undersigned most earnestly protest against the passage of the Keating Owens child labor bill. Whoa, against? Because I've seen a bunch of letters that say, please pass the bill and we can't let the poor babies, the mere babies work. The kids should be out frolicking by woods and water. 
So this is, doesn't fit, okay? We protest against for the following reasons. It would bring hardship among a large number of people, such as wives and infirm parents who are wholly dependent on such labor. That's so different than the, the mere babies who aren't allowed to, to play and be innocent kids. And then uh, the second one, we have state laws in South Carolina that give us all the protections we need. Oh, so these, I've seen other letters where people are saying we need to have this federal law to prevent this terrible thing from happening. But this letter is saying we already have state laws that address this just fine. So I feel like there's actually a lot of disagreement between this letter that I'm looking at now and some of the other ones that I saw in my research. And that's kind of tough to square. Okay, what do you think you heard there? Oh, we've got responses coming in across all the options. So it might be a little tougher. It, 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 this is tough. You can, you can get familiar with historical thinking skills in 15 minutes and you can spend the next four decades of your life getting better at them. All right, keep going, last votes, come on. I've only got about 25% got about of you who are not want to commit to a vote. We want you to oh, vote. Oh, let's That's make so really let's important. vote people. All right, last couple seconds, get them in, get them in, get them in. All right, so the results of our poll, 9% said sourcing, 2% close reading, 73% corroboration, 16% contextualization. So this one was really challenging. I think it's a good illustration of how you can't necessarily isolate each of these skills. So I did do a little bit of sourcing. We talked about, you know, you can see some of the text in there about who these people are and where they're, you know, where they're employed. And, um, and we did do some contextualization. But the thing that I was really hammering home in my Think Aloud was corroboration and trying to fit this in with some of the other sources so that we've got some that support the passage of the uh, Keating Owen bill and some that oppose it. And that's great because now it's illuminated for me the debate that's going on over this bill. And in hindsight, again, everybody says, of course, they're going to pass child labor laws. It's obvious to anyone who sees these photographs that the poor children uh, need to be protected by the government. But this letter has now, through corroboration, opened up this entire other thing I need to think about. Because here are people saying, um, there are people, including infirm parents, like parents who are too sick to work, who depend on their kids to help support the family. So this letter is not just saying, oh, the poor kids don't deserve to play in the woods. You know, they should be shackled to their machinery. It says, it's not just the children who might suffer, like what's gonna to happen to the families in an era in 1916 before there's social security or a social safety net or any kind of government aid. And so that's kind of an interesting argument and corroboration, putting this document next to some of those other letters helps us see the debate that's happening and helps us see why it takes a period of time to get this legislation passed. Well, I think this also brings up one of the points that comes up in the court cases, right? Is this a job for the federal government right? or is this a job for the states, right? We have that division in the constitution. These are the things that the constitution allows the federal government to do and that's it. Everything else goes to the states and that reserve powers clause is part of what's being debated. How much power should the federal government have versus how much do you give South Carolina the right to have different laws than Georgia or Pennsylvania or Minnesota or Texas? And if you go all the way back to one of the first documents that Lynn showed from the Ferrule Manufacturing Company, that was interesting because a lot of these manufacturers, I think of those guys as the fat cats and the big fur coats, but he was complaining about what was happening in the mills in the South. So he's up in Indiana, I think. Uh, he, he's actually in New Jersey. Oh, he's in New Jersey. Okay. But he's not saying, oh, we need to clean this mess up in New Jersey. He's saying, please do something about what is happening down in South Carolina, North Carolina, where I've seen these terrible pictures. And here's somebody in South Carolina saying, South Carolina has its own state laws and they are working just fine. Thank you very much. 
Corroboration pulls these two sources into conversation and helps us see the debate. Absolutely. Anything else you want to add before we jump about putting it together? Put it all together for me. All right, so let's talk in our final segment about how to put this together. And I'm going to tell you, building a historical argument is hard work. We teach a whole class to teachers about how to do it. We work on it for four months. We're doing it here in an hour. But I'm going to make the case that building an argument is something that you do every single day. And the way that I like to explain it to students is I think of it as a triangle. And I used to call this my A-R-E triangle, my argument, my reasoning, and my evidence. And the triangle shape is important, right? Because a triangle only works if the base is large, right? The triangles can't stand on their point. It has to go the other way around. So we have an argument that we want to make, the reasoning behind it, and the evidence to support it. And the evidence is the biggest part of that triangle. Now, you do this every single day, students, right? You have arguments you want to make. I want to get a new phone. I want this, I want that. That's your argument, right? You argue that, not necessarily me. I may or may not agree with your argument, but I'll listen to it. And if you're gonna tell me that you want something, maybe it's an, a, you know, a new item, maybe it's an extended curfew or another privilege, you're gonna to have to make the case to the person who will give you that privilege. So you're gonna to have to make a reason. So in this case, I'm saying, I want a new phone. And my reasoning is that I'm responsible. Now. Stop right there. Could the parent or guardian in your life argue with that? Maybe, maybe not, but you're gonna to have to show some evidence. I can't just say that I'm responsible. I've gotta put the facts out there. So I might provide some facts that I'm keeping my room clean, that I get up for school on time, that I babysit, that I've got good grades, that I'm too tall to ride my own bike, or my old phone is working broken, maybe it's old, it's out of date, something's not right. And sorry for that last one, that was an old one that got thrown in there. But if you can make the case why you need a new phone or a new bike, you can also make the case in history. Now here's the key, this is super, super important. You have to let your evidence drive your argument or your thesis, not the other way around, right? Because if you decide in September, this is my argument and I'm going to prove it, and you haven't done your homework and you haven't done your research, it's not going to work out. So we always have to start with that research, just like we started at the top of the hour. Now, if I'm going to take the research that we've been doing and sharing this hour, I'm going to go back to my argument, right? This is the argument that we agreed. This is the option B that was pretty good. And I said in this argument, the National Child Labor Committee hired Lewis Hines. These photographs created awareness, fueled a debate, swayed public opinion, leading to the laws. So this is the case I'm going to make. And I've got kind of these three points. I've got to organize my evidence, right? I have to pick out the best pieces of evidence to support. And sometimes your teachers might describe these as buckets. Right? How are you going to bucket your evidence? Well, I'm going to look for evidence. I'm going to find my evidence that shows that it creates awareness. So I might look at some of the photographs. I might see where they're published. I might find out what other work this committee did. Right? Lewis Hines is not the only person doing this right now. Um, and I also would find out more about these public lectures. Who was giving them? How were the photographs used? What did people say who attended the lectures? If I'm going to say it fuels a debate, I need to find that debate, right? I need to find editorials on both sides, those letters to members of Congress on both sides. I want to know what public officials are saying, right? What are senators saying? What are governors of state saying or state legislatures saying about this? And is it different in different states? And if I'm going to argue that these photographs swayed the public opinion to change the law, not just once, but twice, that's where I want to look at the pressure that people are putting on legislators. That's where I want to look at the text of the law and are there references to the public in the law. And I'm going to also look at the challenges, right? Both laws were challenged. First time it was overturned by the courts, the second time it was affirmed or maintained by the courts. So I'm going to want to look at all my primary sources. So let's just take this last one and put it into our ARE triangle. 
My argument is that the photograph swayed public opinion. Now, mind you, Dr. Hamner might disagree with that. He might say, you know what, these photographs were nice, but it wasn't that, it was the speaking tour. It wasn't that, it was the fact that people were saw child laborers as making less money and they wanted adults to work. That's a different argument. That's arguments are things we can disagree on. My reasoning is my because. Photographs swayed public opinion because they convinced people that children were working too long for too little pay. Again, my argument, not somebody else's. Somebody else with the same research could come up with different response. And this is where my evidence starts plugging in. This is where I'm pulling those specific quotes, those specific examples, and I'm explaining the connections because that connector is what we call the analysis statement, right? We don't just say, oh, child labor was bad, here's a picture. What is that picture showing? And if you're thinking about analysis, I want you to think of the phrase, this is important because. It's not the prettiest way to start a sentence and you usually end up revising. But that letter to the member of Congress saying you should support this, this letter is important because. Huh, all right, well, let's play with this. Let's pull up this letter. I want you to think, if you're making the case and you're making this argument, and you want to use this letter. So maybe you want to put this letter on your exhibit board, on your website. You might quote from it in a paper or quote from it in a website. How are you going to connect it? Okay. Think about that. I'm going to give you some options. What would be that line that goes underneath? Option A, Oberlin Smith supported child labor laws. B, the movement convinced business leaders that change was needed. C, citizens urged member of members of Congress to support the legislation. Or D, dangerous working conditions highlighted in the photographs convinced business leaders that change was needed. Now these are as clear cut. Don't, you know, think about this for a second. Tell us, what's the best piece of analysis out of these options? Oh, we're getting lots of different spread on this one. Keep going. We've got about 40% of you voting. Oh, this is going to be a good discussion. Come on, 60%. It's okay. Pick one. We want you to pick one. That's part of our discussion, right? It's not a right or a wrong. Because think about it. All these are true, right? So how do you construct that analytical statement? All right, let's go three more seconds. Get your votes in, get your votes in, get your votes in. All right, 1% went for option A, although some other people were in there and changed their mind. 5% went for B, 25% for C, and 69% for D. Hmm, Dr. Hamner, how would you comment on this? One of the first things I, that I'm looking at these, and these are hard because they're all true. And I'm starting to realize, well, I never won anything in National History Day. I, um, I struggled with this one. I think I would go with option D for making the argument. And why D over C? Because oh, I could see people, because I, I watch the bars, right? And I saw people going back and forth between C and D. Why is that? So they're both accurate descriptions of what's going on. Oh, can I, but, uh, no, no, that's fine. Um, but I think that option D is a little more specific about the cause and effect mechanism. So C says citizens urge members of Congress to support the legis legislation. And that's definitely something in evidence in that primary source. But option D gives us a little more so if I was judging National History Day, I think I would appreciate the fact that the project had made exactly what about um, child labor had convinced business leaders that some kind of action for change was needed. So I like that there is an extra level of precision in the description. But this one's tough because 
you know, all four of these are accurate. We're not talking about right and wrong here. We're talking about, you know, good, better, and even better in terms of what kind of interpretation you're presenting your viewer. Absolutely. That difference between not just what, but why, right? Because that person, the author gives a specific reference to the conditions. And that's the argument that I'm trying to make with my thesis. And again, you can make a totally different argument. It's not about having a right answer or a wrong answer. So it's that helps me now, Lynn, because I could see if we had a different letter that said, you need to pass these child labor laws because working kids are making it hard for 20 something men to get jobs. Huh? Um, a, B, and C could all apply to that letter too. Uh -huh. D would not. So D is specific about the why. What is it about this particular letter? So that helps me feel like D, uh, that's giving me more confidence in D as an answer. Well, and those analysis statements are important because sometimes what we see is students put the source there and they want it to speak for itself. But remember, it's important your work as the historian is to make the connection, right? Because we know that Dr. Hamner can look at the source and see one thing, and I can look at the source and see another thing. And Mr. Brochett, we need to know what you see. And that's really important. That's your student voice, right? That's how you pull the threads through. And that's what you're doing with your number of words or your number of minutes. And I'm gonna be honest with you, it's hard to have limits, right? But that's intentional. And Dr. Cameron and I work on a lot of writing product and we talk about word limits and how to get things down and get to the point. But we know as frustrating as it can be in the middle of the process, when you can get to that final point, man, it tends to be much, much, much better writing. And this is the process of putting the puzzle pieces together. So you just like you wouldn't tape all the pieces of a 500 piece puzzle to your exhibit and say, oh, you know, there's a big sunset in there someplace. The analysis and interpretation is you showing how these things attach to each other and fit together to give a bigger picture of a historical moment. So I'm really highly confident in the now. Excellent. All right. Well, I'd just like to throw two other quick things out here, and then we're going to open to question and answer, and I want some props that we got this done in just under an hour. We have a YouTube channel here that we've been working on. We've got lots of you subscribing to it. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you get to see every time we drop a new video. Uh, we've got lots of videos there to help both teachers and students as you're working through. And if you don't already, why aren't you following us on social media, right? We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So please check it out and see what's going on. Because while History Day 2021 is wrapping up, we are gearing up for History Day 2022 debate and diplomacy. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop my share. I know there's a couple good questions in the queue, and if you've got a question for any of us, please go ahead and drop it in. We'd love to hear what questions you have and how we can help you get ready for next year's contest. All right, let's rock and roll here. Lynn, I'm going to toss the first question to you because it is right in your wheelhouse and it's your favorite thing to talk about. So when Amy was working on her project for NHD last year, the judges gave her some feedback that her citations were incorrect on her pictures. So what's the correct format for citing pictures and where might she go to find that information? Oh my goodness, I love bibliographies far more than I should. Okay, with History Day, there are two acceptable options on how to do your citations. So the first way is using the MLA format, the Modern Language Association. The second is referred to as Chicago Turabia, or something that's just Chicago Manual of Style. Both are acceptable for History Day. It's important that you choose one, learn how to do it, and do so consistently. Now, that being said, Chicago Turabian is what historians use. So when we write at History Day, we have to pick two, right? So we pick that Chicago Turabian style. So if you go to nhd.org slash bib resource, we have a full annotated bibliography resource that will take you through and give you different samples. Whatever format you choose, one thing that's really important, you have to remember that citations provide a roadmap. So if Dr. Hamner writes an article and I read the article and I go, oh, 
that's really interesting. I want to know more about this law that you're writing about. I'm going to use not only the footnotes in the article, but then a bibliography at the end, because I want to know where did you get this? Is this from the National Archives? Is this from the Library of Congress? Is this from the Virginia State Archives? Where are you going to dig up this information? Because where could I go and get that information and dig it up as well? It's also a big piece of responsible research, right? If you use an image or you use information from someone else, you have to credit where you got that information from because it's not your information. Now, what we would encourage all our students to do is to pick a format and learn it and work with not only your teacher, but also great resource, our librarians. They are your citation experts and they can help you. If you say, okay, you know what, I have this source and I'm not sure how to cite it, your school or public librarians are often the best helpers in the entire world because librarians live for citations kind of like the way that I do. So check out nhg.org slash bib resource as a resource. There are also plenty of books and websites out there that will either help you with MLA format or Chicago format. But again, pick one be consistent, right? Some of our teachers in schools teach all MLA, some teach all Chicago. One isn't right and one isn't wrong. They're different. They're used in different disciplines. But what is right is that you make sure that you create a paper trail and you create a way for us to follow and find what you find. Because here's a trick. Google is not a source. I see that sometimes in History Day bibliographies. And if you say you got something from Google, that's kind of like saying, I got my fact from the library. Well, I went to this library and it was really big and I got, and there's lots of stuff and my facts came from the Doylestown Public Library. No, I'm sorry, that's just not where they came from, right? They came from a book in the library. They came from an article from a database in the library. They came from a primary source from the library. Same with Google. Google's a great tool, it's like the library. It helps us get to all kinds of places. But if I pulled the image, I didn't pull it from Google Images. I pulled it from the Smithsonian or the Library of Congress or the Minnesota Historical Society. Google Images helped me navigate there the same way the library helped me find the book. So keep that in mind as you're working. And when in doubt, ask. There's lots of people who can help you. All right, next question. Christopher, I'm gonna to toss this one to you. So it's a question about close reading. So one of our viewers has a question about it and wants to know when you're doing close reading, how do you keep it as a close reading and make sure that you're not going to introduce assumptions that can affect the ultimate interpretation when you're doing it? That is a wonderful question. And one of the reasons that close reading is a challenge. So let me see if I can give you a quick answer because a lot of close reading is noticing details and then making educated guesses about what they mean. There are two tools to help you make better educated guesses. Um, one is if you can find drafts of the letter or drafts of the speech or a draft of the cartoon and you can see things that have been changed between the original version and the final version. Um, that might indicate something important about the state of mind of the person who wrote or created it. So if you've got you know, Lewis Hines took 17 pictures in this workshop, but only two of them were submitted to the, you know, the, the congressional committee that commissioned him. And we could start to make some smart, educated guesses about what is it, what are the details about these two compared to the other 15 that sent the message that he wanted. The most useful tool, I think, if you're trying to make sure that your educated guesses are you know, grounded in reality and that they're believable arguments is corroboration. You get more documents, more things to close read and more comparisons to make. So in the cartoon, you heard me think a lot about, oh, she's skeletal and she's kind of dressed in rags and they're in fat, you know, fat cats. I mean, literally like these big guys who look pretty well fed and the fur lined collars and the top hats. So I think that that was trying to emphasize economic inequality and really emphasize unfairness. The person who's doing all the work isn't getting any of the benefits and the people who are just fat and happy are taking advantage. 
I think that's a pretty good educated guess, but I could go look for other cartoons and see if that assumption holds up. In fact, the fat cat, the idea that the industrialists, the factory owners, like those guys appear in a lot of cartoons and they're almost always drawn like that, right? So these guys are not lifting a finger. They're, they're usually pretty well fed. Sometimes they're eating in the cartoon. They're usually pretty portly and they're usually pretty well dressed. And so that would help me kind of focus in on this idea that cartoonists are really emphasizing inequality and the idea of luxury versus, you know, the, the poor person in rags. So corroboration is another good way to check your assumptions that you're making through close reading. And this is why the, the four historical thinking skills work together as a toolkit rather than things you do in isolation. All right. Next question. Lynn, I'm Christopher on this one. So this one's from Cameron. So when she, or he, apologize, uh, did their National History Day project last year, they didn't use a lot of primary sources. And having listened to this talk, they realized maybe they should have used a few more. So what are some good places to start to find primary sources when you're doing your NHD research? Well, I have to say, I love that you did this once and you're learning and growing going to do it again because honestly the best history day projects are from our students who've done it more than once and as a history day kid i did it four times so i understand having a first product that maybe wasn't so good because mine really wasn't the first year either so it's okay that's how we learn and grow right so in terms of great places for primary sources it really depends on your topic so probably the two biggest ones for most of our students are the Library of Congress and the National Archives, assuming that you're doing United States history. If you're doing world history, then you wanna start looking for the National Archives of the country of this, where your topic is taking place. Um, those are kind of two big places that lots of our students tend to go. But you wanna figure out a little more information to see where would house these primary sources. And one of the best ways to start is to find some secondary sources, find a book, and go ahead and see what's in the back of the book, right? What's in their bibliography? You might find that there's a particular university or a particular historical society that holds these records. You also might lead to other books that might have access to other primary sources or help lead you to find those. Now, it's really important. Now, we understand that it's not possible. Sometimes you find an archive and it's like, well, that's great, but that's in California and I'm in Maine. So that's probably not going to work. But more and more, especially after the last year of historical organizations have been working to digitize resources and make more and more of it available online for free. So I would encourage before you go up, oh, it's in California, there goes that. I would do a little research. Can you find it? Sometimes too in history, there's copies of things. There's a copy here, but is there a copy somewhere else? And I think by doing that research, you might be surprised what you find. And often finding one really good primary source in a collection can lead you to a treasure trove. So are there any examples, Dr. Hammond, in your research where you found one and then it's like, oh, wow, look what else there Tons. is. Tons, and just recently, and I really want to emphasize what Lynn just said about getting secondary sources and then going to the bibliography, because that, there, historians actually have a term for that. We call that chasing the footnotes. When I was in high school and college even, I never once looked at the footnotes of the bibliography because I thought, boring. <laughs> now, that's the first thing I turn to in a book. I want to say, like, what are the primary sources that this person used and where did they find them? Uh, so there was one recently that I was looking for in a book for my graduate class about um, bombing in World War II and somebody in their footnote made a reference to leaflets that had been dropped um, instead of bombs they were dropping you know pieces of paper with messages for the soldiers on them and there was a footnote there and, there, and it pointed me to a digital archive and when I got to the digital archive I discovered that they had digitized all sorts of these little leaflets and flyers from all sorts of different countries um, from Japan and from the United States and from Germany and some of them were translated. And then the next thing I knew, 16 hours had gone by, but I had all these new primary sources to think about, and I had a new set of things to apply. Sourcing, close reading, corroboration, 
and contextualization too. So we went right down the rabbit hole, but following one footnote, chasing it down, opened up this whole other thing. And I didn't even know those other things existed. All right. Lynn, I'm going to toss this one to you because I know that you have an answer to this one based on some work you've done in the past. So one of our teachers joining us says, some of my students find images off the internet. They put them in a file and then they present them to me and I have no idea where they come from. <laughs> what is a logical way to track some of those pictures down? Absolutely. The idea of reverse Google image searching is a great, great tool. When you have, an, and we've all done this, right? We've researched, we find something, we save it, and we forget to save the information, right? I don't have the URL it came from. I forgot the date. And it's like, oh, no, and I need that information for my bibliography. I also need it to see if it's like, really, is it this image really from World War II or is it maybe from World War I? So what you do on Google, there's that little camera. You click the camera, you upload the picture that you're looking for and you let Google tell you where you can find it. We have a video on that on our YouTube um, on how to, to, to use the reverse image search. It's one of these things, it's going to take you about three minutes to learn and once you learn it, you should think it's the greatest tool ever. And I've set, found that with so many people, it's like, oh, this is so cool, this is really helpful. Because it's also important to know that those sources, those primary sources that you gather, it's important that we cite them. It's not just books, but it's also images, it might be film or video clips, uh, it might be sound files, so maybe you're doing a documentary and you have music that's playing, um, or sheet music, there's all kinds of things. Responsible research means we give credit. But that being said, keep in mind, if let's say I'm doing my project on Lewis Hine and I have that collection of photographs, it is 100% okay to cite the collection in your bibliography. You do not need to cite 200 photographs separately. Some test users, I'll be honest with you, there's this theory out there that bigger is better when it comes to your bibliography. No. That's what we call padding it, right? You're just trying to make yourself look bigger and stronger, but you're not. What was more important is to say, I found this collection and I use this collection in my annotation to contrast photographs of children at work versus children at school. And that's important because, wow, that's a good annotation that shows me I use the collection and how I use it. I used it to make a comparison. And that's really important because oftentimes historical research, whether it be photographs or textual records from the National Archives, are gathered in collections. The same thing at historical societies or state archives. So if you find a folder, you cite the folder and you use the annotation to explain what's in there. That's really important uh, because I have seen bibliographies that are really, really big, but I've also seen them where there's like 16 encyclopedia articles in them. Come on, we all know you don't need 16 that pretty much say the same thing. And so I'm gonna really encourage you to look for the diamonds, right? If you've got way too much trash and you're just throwing everything in there, or maybe there are sources that you found in September, but by January you weren't really using. You've gotta clean it up, make it clear to the judges, these are the sources I used. Not necessarily every book that I touched in the process of research, because a big important part of research is sometimes putting things aside. Say, you know what, I read this chapter, but it wasn't really useful. Or I thought I was going this direction, but I went that direction. So this article just isn't helpful. And it's okay to delete from a bibliography because that's sometimes what we all need to do with our research and with our writing. All right, well. We have some really great questions in the queue, but sadly we're gonna do one more and we're gonna wrap it up, but please don't worry. Um, we collect all of the Q&A after it's done and we make sure to go through and answer all of your questions. Um, I will say this, there are some of you that are viewing as anonymous attendees right now. If we don't have your information, we can't answer your question. Um, but what you can do is take that question and email it to programs at nhd.org and we are happy to give you a response there, both Lynn and I monitor it. But we are gonna wrap it up with a question from Kristen. She says, 
In using the triangle, argument, reasoning, evidence, how do you use them all together in order to create a strong project that's relatable to the theme and interesting to learn about for the viewers? Oh, that's like what makes a good history day project, right? I think you've got to let your evidence drive the triangles, right? Find your evidence, organize your evidence, then write the arguments that comes out of the evidence. And I actually want to ask Dr. Hamner here because we've had this discussion before and you had a grad professor who said to you one time, if you go into an archive and you've already got your mind made up, what happens if, if I've got my argument and I go and I go to an archive and I do my research, what's going to happen to my project? I'm so glad that you brought that up. I was just telling that story on Monday night. So I think I love the triangles approach. And one of the things that I really like about it is that you build from the bottom up, right? You don't start at the top of the pyramid and then build them down. You start with the evidence. And my own advisor, when I was in graduate school, I'd say, oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to go into the archives. And this is way back in the way back before everything was digitized. So you had to get on a bus and actually go into the archive. And I said, I think that A caused B and I'm going to go into the archive to prove that. And he looked at me and he said, Christopher, if you go into the archive looking for documents to prove that A caused B, you will definitely find them because the archive is so big that you can find you know, documents that say that. But the problem is if you know what you're looking for, you might ignore or overlook things that complicate your argument. So if there are a thousand items in this archive and you've already decided that A causes B, you might say, not this, not this, not, oh, I found this, I found one, oh, I found two, oh, I found three, good, I've shown that A caused B. But the other 997 primary sources might suggest that A caused C or that D caused A. And so you've got to keep an open mind. And so you want to have a kind of question that you're trying to solve, but let your sources speak to you and build the pyramid, you know, start sketching out the pyramid from the bottom up. I had another mentor in graduate school who used to always ask people when they finished a project, he would say, he had this very distinctive German accent, and he would say, what kind of evidence would convince you that your argument is wrong, and where did you look for it? Which was a really good reminder to kind of, you know, be, a, be looking for things that might complicate or, you know, how will you know if your hypothesis needs to be adjusted? And building from the ground up helps you do that. If you start at the top, you go looking for things that are going to support it, you'll find them because the world's a big place. But you want to make sure that you've looked at enough things so you have an idea of like, yeah, this is pretty representative. I think those are two really good points. Let your evidence build your argument and be open to adjusting your argument, right? Maybe you have an initial one and then maybe you find something new. Maybe you need to adjust. Maybe you go to a regional contest and get some feedback from a judge and maybe you want to make those adjustments in your argument or your evidence before you advance up to a state or affiliate contest. And that's what we do, right? We're working, actually, Dr. Hannon, I've been working on a book that'll be coming out this fall. We've been working on this for over a year. Has the book changed since the first iteration? <laughs> yes, because that's part of the process. I think sometimes students have it in their mind that adults or adults who are good writers write something, they fix the typos, maybe they'll, they might have like a comma here or there, and then it gets published. And that's not what happens, right? We have to rework. We have to say, you know what? I'm trying this analogy, it's not working. Or you know what, we've got too much of this, we don't have enough of that. Or, hey, we forgot something in the middle here. We've got to add this page. And being open to the process, being open to getting feedback, whether it's from your peers, your teachers, your librarians, your judges, is part of what's gonna make you a better historian and help build you a stronger argument. And let me just jump on that. It can be kind of scary if you think, well, I'm going to prove that A caused B. And then you go out and you start to find primary sources that suggest that you were wrong. This actually happened to me in my first big project as a historian. I went in with a pretty good idea of why, why something had happened. And the further I got into it, I was like, this, your hypothesis is just not right. These sources are saying it's, it's actually pretty much the opposite. And instead of being like scary or discouraging, that actually felt pretty good because I, I had this light bulb moment where I thought, oh, this is much more interesting and much more complicated than I thought it was originally. Now I have a lot more to talk about. I have a much more interesting argument. And I started to realize that 
I had gone in with a kind of simple idea and I had learned that it was much richer and more interesting. And so don't be afraid to, to make a course correction or make a revision or change your ideas. Like be open to, as Lynn said, to the process. And, you know, often what, what might seem in the, in the moment as kind of discouraging or a setback turns out to be something that opens up an even better version of your project down the road. It happens a lot, even to people who've been doing this for a long time. All right. Well, I'm going to pause it at that point and say thank you, thank you, thank you. We've had an awesome week of NHD programming. Thank you to Mr. Braccio for running all the pieces behind the show. Thank you to Dr. Hamner for coming on. But most importantly, thank you to our students and to our teachers. You have made this happen in a year where there's been more challenges than we ever imagined there could be. And it is so exciting to not only see your work here at the national level, but as we're prepping for that award ceremony that comes on Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern, we are so excited to see your work, share your work with the world. Congratulations to all of you who were selected for one of our three showcases for documentaries, exhibits, or performances. And best of luck. We can't wait to see what your 2022 History Day projects look like. So have a wonderful day. Happy History Day. And we'll sign off from there. Bye.